Okay, we'll uh, continue uh, studying Titus uh, chapter 1, verse uh, 10, where um, Paul is writing about the, uh, the characteristics of false teachers, and he's saying in verse 10 that they are insubordinate, idle talkers, and de deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. So he's saying that they are idle talkers, which means they basically are talking idle things, which is Jewish fables, you know, they're talking about fictitious tales about Adam, Moses, Elijah, and other Old Testament saints, and also uh, commandments of men where, you know, they're imposing uh, legis legalistic and ascetic rules, uh, which are very futile uh, for dealing with the uh, flesh. And um, so Paul is saying that, you know, um, it's important or it's absolutely necessary that we have elders, overseers, leaders who hold fast the faithful message in God's word, who are strong in their doctrines, um, because uh, they alone, you know, uh, um, uh, can refute these false teachers and it's only the teaching and preaching of God's word that has the power to change lives and to overthrow false teachings and doctrines. And then about the false teachers, he's saying they're deceivers because um, not only that they are deceived themselves by Satan, but they're also going around and deceiving others. And hence, it's only because since it's... Um, uh, the work of Satan, that he's deceiving people, it's only the truth in God's word that has the power to change um, lives. And then he says, especially those of the circumcision, if you look at it in the easy translation version, says some Jewish followers, uh, if you look at it in a passion translation, uh, this phrase is rendered as converts from Judaism. So this gives us a clue as to the identity of the nature of these false teachers who are troubling the creed. Uh, or these Jewish converts, the Jewish believers, are the ones who are basically, uh, you know, teaching these false or spreading these false teachings and doctrines uh, and who insist that circumcision is necessary for. Uh, salvation. So it's not somebody from the outside of the church, but somebody within. Uh, and it's so sad that they are these Jewish uh, converts, Jewish Christian believers who are uh, teaching this and saying this. And verse 11, he says, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, um, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. So he's saying, um, whose mouths must be stopped, just as there is a moral necessity for elders to be men who hold firmly to the truth of God's word that we see in verse 9. Um, and this, uh, But there is also moral necessity that these men, uh, you know, uh, to be silenced uh, uh, or these uh, leaders to silence these men who are false teachers. And uh, Paul is saying the word must, uh, which means the word shows us that, you know, uh, or the word must uh, means it shows us that Paul has placed a demand on Titus uh, to prevent those who distort uh, the truth or uh, teach false doctrine. So the word must, he's saying, you know, you must do something to stop it, you know. Um, so uh, the word stopped here is, uh, you know, uh, it basically Paul is saying that the offenders or these false teachers must be refused opportunity to spread their false teachings in the churches and also in terms uh, that include silencing them, um, you know, by a logical denial of their view. So don't give them opportunity to preach and teach the word and also silence them by, you know, uh, logically uh, denying their views, okay, uh, which will prevent them from spreading their false doctrines or making it possible to spread their false doctrines anymore. And it will not weaken the households. 
Okay. He says that uh, these uh, uh, whose mouths might be stopped, who subvert whole, how whole households. So these false teachers uh, did not, you know, uh, their teaching did not convert people, but uh, subvert the 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 word or the uh, the word their word means turn. Okay, so subvert means to overturn or to overthrow. So the stress is on the, basically the disastrous effect that um, their false teaching is happening on households. Now, why is Paul mentioning households here? Because the early church, um, you know, they met in, they were basically house churches. They met in uh, houses. There were a few families who met together. Um, and so he's talking basically, or he's referring, giving, uh, he's meaning house churches. Uh, or if he's meaning even households, he's saying that, you know, when these men uh, teach their false teachings and do doctrines, they're basically going to teach it and spread it to other men. And the men who are the authority in the household, you know, will come back and teach the same thing to their wives and children and want them to change according to that. So how it's destroying uh, families. So either way, it's destroying families, whether it's in the house churches or individuals, it's destroying uh, the churches and it's destroying uh, the homes and the families. And he's saying that these people do it, their main motive of these false teachers, like he has already mentioned, in, in Romans and in Timothy is that it is to make money, you know. They don't care what they believe, uh, but all they are interested is they do all this just to make money, okay. And verse 11, uh, you know, basically points us to the uh, seducive in nature of these uh, uh, false prophets or the seducive activity of the false teachers and why they must be uh, silence because Paul is saying their motive is dishonest gain, their method is teaching what they ought not to teach, and uh, that is false doctrine, and uh, it has multiple results, which means it's misleading uh, churches and individual families. Okay, so their motive is dishonest gain, their method is teaching what they ought not to teach, that is false doctrines. And it is having, having multiple effects or results that is misleading the house churches or misleading the whole families. And then verse 12, he says, one of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. So Paul is basically quoting this um, line from a poet called Epimendis. Uh, and... Um, you know, um, this poet is held in great honor by the people of Crete. Uh, he's looked at as, as a prophet, as a poet, as a religious reformer. So uh, by quoting him, Paul is avoiding, uh, to, uh, avoiding, of, avoiding to be blamed uh, as an anti-Cretan when he says that all Cretans are, uh, you know, uh, liars, uh, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. Okay, look at how he is uh, uh, explaining who the Cretans are. He's saying that they're not just liars, but always liars. They're not just beasts, but evil beasts. They're not just gluttons, but lazy gluttons. Okay, so he's basically pointing out to the basic character of the Cretans. And uh, it also shows, you know, um, why... Paul is saying that Titus has to uh, appoint good leaders with certain qualifications which is needed. Um, uh, and if these congregations or these Cretans, you know, um, if they are left by themselves, you know, the whole false teaching can dominate the churches and can destroy the whole churches uh, because of who they are, because of their basic nature. So he's saying so important to have and appoint good leaders. Verse 13, he's saying, this testimony is true, therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in their faith. This testimony is true means he's, he's agreeing with what Epimendus is saying about his own people, the Cretans. And he's saying, therefore rebuke them uh, sharply. 
Now, the emphasis in the word rebuke is that of convict. That means, you know, uh, they're, they're found guilty and hopefully convinced, which means prove to. Uh, so he's saying because of the serious nature of these false teachers and the character of these false teachers, you know, you have to rebuke them uh, sharply, which means severely, rigorously, you know, uh, a sharp, only a sharp rebuke will catch their attention and nothing less than a sharp rebuke would, uh, call, would you know, uh, would try to stop the problem or if you don't give them a sharp rebuke, it will continue, the problem will continue and it will become too difficult to handle, okay. And then he says, you know, uh, rebuke them. So it's a direct reference to the false teachers, basically. Um, and also he's saying that, you know, also rebuke those church members who are not sound in the faith, but are open and interested in these false teachers. So it can be rebuke them sharply means it can be both the false teachers and it can also be the church members who are not sound in their faith or babes in the faith and who are so open or interested in these false teachers teaching uh, that they may be sound in the faith so he's saying why should you rebuke them sharply the result is so that they can be sound that means they can be whole healthy in the faith so the goal to rebuke is restoration and Paul's hope is that you know this sharply rebuking them would bring these Cretan believers to the wholeness of the truth uh, the wholeness of the doctrine, wholeness of the faith that is in Christ uh, Jesus, because they are basically having a sick belief system, and restoration to the truth would help them to become healthy in their uh, faith. So, likewise, you know, it is, should be the goal of us as as people who are called into full time ministry, or people who are ministering the church, or leading a Bible study group, or a prayer group. <coughs> sorry that uh, you know our goal should be to bring people uh, in the in uh, whoever we're ministering to or teaching to to a place of sound faith sound doctrine in Christ Jesus okay we'll move on to verse 15 uh, he says so pure all things are pure but to those who are defiled and unbelieving nothing is pure but even their mind and conscience are defiled so he says all things meaning is basically talking about all kinds of food here created by God uh, for us to eat. Um, what he's, uh, what Paul already mentions or writes to Timothy in First Timothy chapter five, verse five. So these false teachers are basically saying, teaching that you know um, uh, that the new believers, so Gentiles who come into faith in Christ Jesus, they should follow the Jewish. Uh, uh, food laws or the ways of eating, the customs of the Jewish food laws. And Paul says that to a believer, all food is clean. Okay, like we read in Mark chapter 7, verse 15, uh, there is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him, but that which comes out of him uh, are those things that defile a man. So those who are internally pure, all things are pure. And uh, this statement does not uh, include sinful things because sin is never pure, but it's basically talking about uh, uh, food here. Okay, and the word uh, defiled uh, it basically means when a person either rejects the truth of salvation by grace um, as an unbeliever, or because of other forces. Um, you know, and uh, you know, like what these Jewish believers, Christians, uh, or legalistic Judaizers are saying, you know, uh, and they're trying to say that you need to add to your sanctification all of these works so that you can maintain your uh, salvation. Okay, so saying that their mind, their thinking uh, process is become defiled or polluted. Um, and uh, you know this once their mind is polluted or defiled this influences their faith their actions uh, and their faith and actions become defiled as well okay 
Um, and he says that, you know, even their conscience, um, uh, even their mind and conscience are uh, defiled. So, uh, in First Timothy chapter, sorry, in Titus chapter 1 verse 15, it demonstrates that, you know, pure, uh, 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 you know, demonstrates that true purity lies not just in observing external rules, but in the inner purity of the heart, okay? A heart that has been cleansed, that has been washed, uh, that has been re regenerated to the personal faith and trust in the person and work of Jesus Christ and what he has completed on the cross and the provision that he's made for our salvation, okay? This will lead to moral righteousness or moral rightness uh, and character and also will give us the discernment that we need or the ability that we need to discern uh, what is true, what is good, what is evil. And then um, the last verse in this chapter, verse 16, he says, they profess to know God, but in works they deny him being admonable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. So in verse 16, basically Paul states a fact that sums up the matter uh, regarding the false teachers, He's saying uh, these false teachers were not necessarily unbelievers. They profess to know God, which simply means they know him as their savior. Uh, but it could also be a profession uh, to know him in a deeper and more intimate way through observing rules and regulations which they were seeking to impose on others. But, you know, in works, they deny him, which means they disregard him, dis they refuse, disown him. So it means, um, you know, they basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, fall back from their previous relationship with him into unfaithfulness, okay? It also means that they abandon their fellowship with the Lord, uh, uh, or in other words, we can say that these false teachers who are saved have slipped back into works or legalism and they have fallen away from the way of grace or, uh, you know, righteousness by grace to faith, you know, uh, grace the way of life or the previous grace relationship they had with the Lord when they accepted him uh, first, okay? So he's saying that these are the people who have, uh, you know, deny him because they're now going back to works and not looking at salvation uh, by uh, which they receive by grace through uh, faith. So how do these uh, people deny him? Uh, it is explained in the following words that point to their true condition. Uh, so by describing the condition, Paul you know, is using very strong words. He's saying being admonable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. That means he's using very strong words here. The word abnormal means detestable. It basically carries the idea of disgusting. You know, so those people who turn away from grace into legalism and who teach others to do the same thing, Paul is saying that they are detestable before. God. He's saying they're disobedient, which means, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the disobedience is because of the lack of faith or trust in God. You know, when we fail to trust or, um, uh, or trust or put our faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ as our Savior, you know, uh, we begin to then disobey God's will or not do what He wants us to. Uh, do. And they're disqualified. Uh, the Greek word means rejected, not standing the test. Uh, they are unqualified, worthless, and unfit for every good work. Okay. Now, the reason why God has created us or one of the purposes for life is so that we can manifest the glory of God, we can serve Him, uh, we can preach and teach his word and make known his gospel known to the ends of this world. 
okay and we can do this only through faith in christ we can serve god only through faith in christ and also you know um um by trusting in him by just uh, leaning on his all sufficient sufficiency uh, in providing us that everything that we need for life and godliness everything that we need to serve him and only then can we become fit for every good work okay so that is what uh, he says in, uh, in chapter one where he's talking about uh, choosing the elders, why we need to choose these, what kind of elders we need to choose and why we need to look at those qualifications. Uh, and then he goes on to talk about the characteristics of false teachers in verses 10 to uh, 16. Okay. Any questions, any doubts? Anything anyone likes to say? No questions, no doubts. Okay, if there are no questions, doubts, we'll move on to chapter 2. Uh, so can somebody please read Titus chapter 2 verses 1 to 3, please. Titus chapter 2 verses 1 to 3. But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in my in faith, in love, in patience, the older women likewise, that they may be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Amen. Thank you, Lubega. Verse 1, he says, but as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Okay, so he's uh, beginning um, this part of the section of this letter by saying, but as for you, means he's contrasting Titus with the false teachers that Paul has just described in chapter 1, verses 10 to 16. Where Paul is saying that these men are rebellious, empty talkers, deceivers you know, who are upsetting whole families for the sake of uh, uh, dirty gain and uh, who are teaching Jewish myths and the commandments of men rather than truth in God's word. And, um, you know, he's, and, uh, he's saying such kind of teaching is not leading to godliness and good deeds. So uh, he's saying in contrast, Titus was to speak the things that are proper for sound doctrine. Now, the things Paul, uh, uh, the things here he's he's uh, saying is the things that he's mentioned in verses uh, two uh, to ten, which pertains to truth, uh, to attitudes and actions that are based on biblical truth. Okay, so he says which are proper for sound doctrine. Now, the Living Bible says, speak up for right living that goes along with true Christianity. And the New Living Translation says, or renders this uh, phrase as, promote the kind of living that reflects right teaching. The Passion Translation renders this verse as, your duty is to teach them to embrace a lifestyle that is consistent with sound doctrine. So the idea behind this phrase, which are proper for sound doctrine, has to do more with right living and not just right thinking. Okay. Uh, whereas when we studied in verse uh, uh, chapter one, verse nine, where he talks about sound doctrine, the focus is on teaching sound doctrine. Uh, which can refute the error, okay? Whereas the focus in chapter 2, verse 1 about sound doctrine is more on the practical application of the sound doctrine. And we see that Paul always ties together sound doctrine with 
practical Christian living that flows out of it. So to have doctrine without practice is basically dead belief. When you have the doctrine, it translates into the way you live, the way you think in basically living and your actions. And verse 2, he says that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, and in patience. Okay, so Paul wanted Titus to know that older men must live with a sense of maturity and with uh, wisdom. This means that they should be sober, reverent, and living temperate lives. Okay, so the command here is to teach them these things uh, means that these things don't automatically come with age. Okay, if you are older, you know, and these qualities don't describe you, then you need to focus on them rather than, you know, go on as you are. So the qualities that older men should have is being be sober. Uh, sober means being vigilant, watchful over themselves, uh, watchful over their conduct, their conversation. Uh, and in case they act evil, you know, it would be a wrong example to the younger people. So they need to be very sober. They need to be reverent, which means older men should uh, be honorable in their behavior, in their speech, in their dressing. Uh, they need to be temperate. Uh, the word literally means, uh, you know, not to be intoxicated with wine or any strong drink. Uh, but it also has the meaning of being sober-minded and clear-minded, okay? Uh, then he says, sound in faith. Sound means uh, healthy. Uh, older men should have healthy faith in God that comes from trusting God in uh, the practical uh, matters of life that they have experienced all of these past years. They should be sound in their minds, the doctrine of their faith, lest they should lead, uh, you know, or try to lead others into wrong teaching, into error. Um, and uh, they should live in such a way that their faith uh, should appear right and genuine before God. Okay. And then he says, in love, uh, you know, uh, older people, as they grow older, they become more grouchy <laughs> and hard to live with. So uh, he's saying that they should be more loving uh, rather than becoming more intolerant and hardened towards others. They should become more gracious and compassionate. Impatience basically means, um, you know, just being steadfast, um, enduring, uh, not just passive waiting. You know, older men are not just, uh, should not just live their lives waiting patiently for the day when they will uh, pass on to eternity or the day when they will die, okay? Uh, they need to be active, actively endure the challenges of this life, e even uh, the challenges of old age. They should continue running their race with endurance, um, like it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1, to 1 and 2, fixing their eyes on Jesus, the author, perfect, and the finisher of their race. So he's saying that older men, when they have these qualities, they will stand out in the world. They will stand out in the church. They will stand out uh, to the younger men. And they can point people to the beauty of Christ. And now he's saying not only older men, but also older women, likewise be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. So the older women, likewise, you know, it's basically talking about older women who have no longer responsibilities of child rearing, uh, typically around the age of 60, and what kind of behavior these older women should have. They should be reverent in their behavior. Now, the Greek word translated reverent is, the, is used only here in the Bible. So the word reverent, the Greek word used for reverend here in this verse 3 is the only place that is used here in the Bible. And it basically um, conveys the idea of being priest-like, okay, uh, or acting as a representative of God. 
um, and acting as a representative of God is a word Paul would like to use to describe, you know, those who are devout uh, and uh, those who are, you know, women of godly character. And he's saying that the older women are to live like holy priests, uh, serving God, uh, you know, in His presence uh, through their sacred uh, personal devotion to the Lord, and also. Uh, that this kind of life will have an influence on, you know, every aspect of their lives and also have an influence on others. Then he talks about, uh, you know, reverent in behavior. It basically points about their inner character, not slanderers. Very interesting. Uh, what is the Greek word for slanderers? Anyone knows? What is the meaning for the Greek word slanderers? The Greek word for slander is, uh, slanderers is diabolos. Okay, and di diabolos is the name of Satan, and it's used. This word is used thirty-four times in the New Testament. Okay, so um, uh, so slanderers are basically who? Who are slanderers? Who are slanderers? Who oh, are not speaking the truth? Okay, those who not speak the truth. You don't speak the truth about others. You basically defame them. You basically are backbiting, attacking people's character, character assassination. Uh, slanderers, those who don't speak the truth. So the slanderers, uh, the, another word is, uh, the, the Greek word for slanderers is diabolos, which is the, the name for Satan, and it's used 34 times in the New Testament. And we know that Satan um, is a false accuser, okay? Um, and each time he, uh, you know, he falsely accuses a, a believer uh, of false doing, uh, you know, um, uh, so that they are doing Satan's work. So he's saying that, you know, these older women who have no responsibilities now, they basically have no responsibility of child rearing, so they basically have no family responsibilities, they're free, so they can sit around talking. And that's why he's saying, you know, they should be reverent in their behavior. They should act like priests. They should be representatives of God. So these older women, you know, they can slander, they can gossip. And he says, when you do that, you're actually doing the devil's work. Okay. And um, uh, godly women are never to surrender their tongues to the devil. So, you know, I don't know how many of us have uh, this weakness of slandering others, talking bad about others, defaming them, uh, backbiting, uh, and it's a serious thing because the work of the enemy, you know, Satan's work, because he's a false accuser himself. So we need to be very careful and ask God for forgiveness and, um, you know, um, uh, repent and not do that. And then he says, not given too much wine. Now, you know, it's common for these older women in the Greco Roman world you know, the Roman Greek culture um, that, you know, um, women um, take, uh, drink a little wine because they have these body aches and pains. So it's uh, uh, kind of a relief for them. And also uh, they take wine to drown their loneliness or depression. Okay. But as they keep taking little by little, they get, uh, you know, addicted to it, uh, you know, and that is sin. And they're actually not relying on God, uh, you know, to overcome their weaknesses, their loneliness, their depression, um, and not relying on God to experience his, uh, the joy of his um, salvation. Okay. So uh, he's saying that, you know, um, uh, uh, don't, uh, the, uh, the women should not be given too much wine. Okay. Now the word given in Greek is uh, dulio, which means the same word, you know, bond servant, which we saw doulos. It's dulio, which means uh, enslave bondage. Okay. 
just a minute, please. It means um, enslave or uh, bondage. Okay, so he's saying don't become a slave uh, uh, or don't get into addiction or bondage to much um, wine, which can become a case even as women take wine, you know, just for uh, physical treatments or just to drown their loneliness and depression. But he's saying they need to trust and depend on God. And teachers of good things and other qualifications says the teachers of good things can mean uh, not only the word of God, but also teach by the kind of life they are living, living holy, upright lives before God and before others. So godly women should be spirit controlled in every part of their life. They should um, exercise, uh, you know, restraint um, uh, or resist things uh, in any area of their, uh, of their lives which is not pleasing, acceptable in God's sight. And they should not become slaves of any substance, any amusement, any fashion, any attitude that does not please um, their God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, before we go on to verses uh, 4 to 8, anyone has any questions? Anything you'd like to say? Okay, if there are no questions, uh, no doubts, we'll move on to verses 4 to 8. Now he moves on to in the instructions for younger women, younger men and younger women in the church. Okay, so can someone please read verses 4 to 8, please? Or you all want me to stop here or do you want me to continue? <laughs> or it's become too much? You want me to stop here or continue with two verses four and eight? Okay, I'll continue. Thank you, Subhashish. Okay, verses four to eight, can somebody read, please? That they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, cast, uh, chest, who make us good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober mind in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ascend, having nothing evil to say to you. Amen. Thank you, Subhashish. So the young woman, according to Paul's instruction, Titus was not to make it his ministry to teach the young women directly. Instead, he's basically to equip and encourage the older women to teach the younger women. Okay. And then he says, admonish. Now, this is one word is... Um, you know, is uh, used variously in by three versions. In the KJV, it says teach. In the um, NIV, it says train. And the NAS, um, New American Standard Version, it says encourage. So the context and the word imply that um, it was to be a process of teaching, explaining, encouraging, training, and holding these young women, these young wives, to a standard that was unfamiliar to them, but yet it is very, very vital or important for their success in their marriage and their families. Okay? Why do we say it was unfamiliar to them? Because they came from you know, uh, pagan backgrounds, and they were unfamiliar with the Christian way of life. So the Greek word for admonish means basically to train someone in self-control, uh, restore to senses, and exhort earnestly. So Paul is tell saying that the older women are to admonish the younger women in seven areas. What is the seven areas? The first one is to love their husbands okay now in paul's day uh, men and women 
uh, were saved out of a culture where romantic love usually did not exist in marriage. Now, wives were only seen as uh, trusted uh, keepers of the home and uh, women who had to bear children. And most husbands look for emotional love outside of marriage. But salvation in Christ Jesus stopped the immorality in most believing men uh, during Paul's time or during that time. But salvation did not make them or their wives, uh, you know, instantly close or intimate with each other and sharing lives like friends and lovers. So when these younger women um, saw how these older women loved, uh, respected, admi uh, admired, and were best friends with their husbands, you know, they would be drawn um, to see that close, intimate relationship with husbands where possible. And, uh, you know, it's very profitable for uh, uh, Christian marriage uh, and for their family life. Okay. So he's setting the older women, you set an example. To love their children, um, now, you know, the godly responsibility of these younger women uh, is uh, very, they're in a, in a very strategic place of and position of influence to influence their husbands and their children, and they must let uh, love dominate their influence. And he says to be discreet, the Greek word means uh, be self controlled, it means to be in control of one's passions. Okay, so even as a young, you know, he's saying. The, uh, you know, have self-control over your passions. Be chaste. The Greek word means be innocent, pure, clean, and perfect, which means, uh, you know, in, in your area of sexual purity, you need to be innocent, pure, clean, and perfect. Okay? And homemakers, young women should take care of their own home, their family affairs, and not be busy bodies roaming around, you know, um, concerned about the matters about their neighbors and people around them, uh, not just spending uh, time in idle talk and gossiping. And he says, good. Uh, so the, in this context, it, it means uh, kind to servants, uh, to those who are poor and strangers, um, you know, the kind of good uh, woman uh, thinks of the needs of others and goes out of the way to meet those uh, needs. Not just about a husband and children, immediate family, but also those who are poor, those who work for them, be kind and uh, good to them. Obedient to their husbands, okay? So it's another way of expressing the wife's duty of submission in a marriage relationship. And he's saying that do all of this so that the word of God may not be blasphemed. So the word may be blasphemed by whom? If they have unbelieving husbands, you know, who by the ill conduct of their believing wives would be provoked to speak bad about the gospel of Jesus Christ or bad about Jesus himself. So he's saying if you have unbelieving wife, husbands or husbands who are not living the truth or not have accepted Jesus the Lord and Savior, he's saying, by your lifestyle, you know, you can lead them to Christ or even by a wrong lifestyle, you can get them to talk bad about the gospel and about Jesus Christ, okay? And then verse 6, he says, likewise exhort the young men to be sober-minded. So um, likewise, this word, basically links verse 6 to the earlier verses. It shows that uh, what the young men need to learn isn't all that different from what the younger or the older men and women need to learn. So based on their age, <clears throat> it may differ slightly, but the essential message is the same for everyone, that they need to live godly lives. So then he says, uh, you know, to these young men, he's saying, be sober-minded. Now, if you look, this word sober-minded is a word that Paul has been used repeatedly in this letter. He uses it here again uh, with reference to young men. 
Um, and uh, this word sober minded basically means to be self controlled, to have control over one's passions, one's desires, uh, to be sound in your judgment, to know what is right and wrong, and to do what is right. And uh, it's basically just a single word, but uh, it captures the main quality of what these young men need. They need to be sober minded so that they can be godly. Okay. In verse 7, he says, In all things, show yourself to be a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, and incorruptibility. Okay. Um, So Paul is uh, talking about younger men, uh, and directly he's telling Titus, who was all, also probably in his 30s. Uh, Paul lists four areas where Titus needs to be an example. He's saying, in all things, showing yourself to be pattern of good works. Now, the New Living Translation says, and you yourself must be an example to them by doing good works of every kind. So Paul is basically telling Titus that he should not uh, just not teach, but he should also show by example how young men ought to live. And if he lives in the same way, then his teaching would also be taken seriously. Okay, People will take his teaching seriously if they see that he is walking after the Lord and walking in accordance with his word. So he's saying, and then uh, in uh, the second thing he says, in doctrine showing integrity. Okay. Now the CEV version, uh, the contemporary uh, English version says, renders this verse as, be sincere and serious when you teach. The ESV version, uh, the ESV says, uh, when you teach, be honest and serious. Or it says, in your teaching, show integrity and dignity. So hence, the doctrine here is not referring to the context of the doctrine taught, but you know has reference to the qualities of the teacher who's teaching the doctrine. So the words integrity and reverence are the attributes in reverence to the qualities of the teacher. So Paul is telling Titus, as a teacher of this doctrine, you need to be sincere, you need to be serious, you also need to be honest, you need to show integrity and, you know, uh, have dignity. That means you need to be sincere, faithful, and you need to be honest and, uh, you know, um, in a simple, in an honest, dignified and serious manner, you need to live up to the commands, the teachings of God, and also you have to teach it in such a way that, and live in such a way that God's word will command or receive that kind of respect. Okay. Okay, we'll finish verse 8 and we'll stop. Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed having nothing evil to say. So he's saying his teaching and words too must be thoughtful as well as, you know, it has to be aligned to the truth of the doctrine so that he cannot be shown as or pointed out as someone who is unsound and no one can find fault with him. And if anyone who is against him, you know, will not find an uh, excuse to put him down or to talk back, or uh, show that he's not worthy to teach or preach. Um, and also, you will not uh, be there to shame him or put him to shame. And there will not be anything bad that they can say about his life. Okay. We'll stop here. We look at the instructions for bond servants in verses uh, 2, uh, verses uh, 9 to 10. Uh, not next week. Next week we won't have class because it's Good Friday. It's a holiday, so we'll meet only week after next, um, which is what is the date for the the following Friday? Um, that is fifth of April. Okay, fifth of April. Anyone has any questions, doubts? Any questions or doubts?
Okay, if not, we'll end class here today. Thank you, everyone, for joining class. Uh, have a blessed weekend and see you on April 5th to continue a study on uh, Titus chapter 2. Thank you.